Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Ten years ago, I think I would have opposed this bill because I would have taken the conventional view expressed by one or two colleagues on these benches today. The last decade has led me to believe that the chasm that has grown between the political classes and the ordinary voter, the, the, the population of the country, uh, has grown too wide. Some of the reasons, of course, have been uh, the expenses crisis, but it was by no means either the only or the first reason. As, uh, as my honourable friend said, this, this trend has been going on for a long time, but it's now getting to a crisis point, in my view. So I came to the conclusion that uh, a recall bill was necessary, and like the honourable gentleman who just spoken, I will vote for this bill this evening. Although I have to say, I don't view it as a recall bill. This, in fact, if anything, is a parliamentary expulsion bill. It's a bill that actually makes it easy for the establishment of this House to expel somebody from this House. Imagine the circumstance. You are in a constituency and you are found to be wanting by your peers in the Standards and Privileges Committee, no doubt with a vast hue and cry from a number of tabloid and red top newspapers and then it's put to your constituency if 10% of you vote in this uh, referendum that this man will go. Forget that 90% bear in mind might want you to stay, only 10% have to vote under those torrid circumstances and you'll be expelled. I would think nobody who was criticised and set up in that way would survive the process and would not be reselected by their party thereafter, so might stand like Dick Taverne, or the Honourable Gentleman has just spoken, or indeed me, as it were, on their own account, but uh, they would not survive the normal political process. This is, as I say, a mechanism for political expulsion. Now, I might find that tolerable if the mechanisms we had in this House met any sort of judicial test. But I have to tell the House that I've been here some 25 years, and I say this with no ill reflection on the people who serve on and chair the Standards and Privileges Committee. But I suggest members of the House carry out an experiment. They take a list of all the people who have been ruled against by the Standards and Privileges Committee and make them into two columns, front benches and back benches. I won't go into you know, uh, those within the gilded circle and those who are the mavericks, just front benches and back benches and look at the treatment of people for the same crime. And you'll find two classes of justice. We do not deliver justice in this House. We deliver an opinion of the establishment of the House. And that's why the public are not wrong to actually view our systems as intolerable. Yes, yes. Now, I'll give one example. I'm not going to give the examples of those who have been let off, because that would be perhaps uh, meanly in these circumstances. But I give one example of somebody who, in my view, was very badly treated. Um, and that was somebody who's no friend of mine, indeed no friend of almost anybody in this house, Ken Livingston. When, some time ago, I've forgotten, the, it was about a decade ago, uh, he had a series of, uh, he had income from a series of speaking engagements. He went to the, uh, the, Registrar of Interests and asked how he should declare these. And he declared it in the way that the Registrar recommended. Then later on somebody found out how much money he made from this. I think it was over £100,000, a lot of money anyway. And suddenly he was hauled before the Standards and Privileges Committee and he was forced to make an apology you know, from the bench over there. Why? Well, he was an outsider. He was a maverick. He was somebody who had no friends in the House, no friends certainly in the parties of the House. And uh, it wasn't the only case like that. There would be a number of others I could pick on. But frankly, that's not justice, that's not democracy, and it would not improve this House to formalise that process uh, by the mechanism that the government, the government minister has put before us today. The only way that could be made to work was if we replaced the standards and privileges process with a judicial process. And I don't think this House really wants to introduce the law into its mechanisms. Uh, but if it, if it does want to go down the route of having that test, then it's going to have to be a judicial test. Indeed, if ever I 
was in front of the Standards and Privileges Committee. I suspect I would be looking for a judicial remedy immediately uh, if that happened. So this is not a recall bill as it stands. It's a parliamentary expulsion bill, and we should understand that. Now, I will, I am a supporter, as has been said a number of times in this, in this debate, of the proposals put forward by my uh, honourable friend, the member for Richmond Park, who has been a, uh, a principled campaigner for this, uh, for this reform for some time. And I'm not going to spend very much longer of the House's time, but just to remind them of the differences. The government's mechanism either takes a, a criminal mechanism or the House's judgment and turns it into a one-off 10% referendum, and it's over. My honourable friend's proposal has a 5% first threshold to start the process. That triggers the timetable. A 20% threshold following that. That, in my constituency, will be just short of 15,000 voters. I have never seen any campaign in my constituency get 15,000 voters to get out and go and voluntarily uh, put their name on a petition over the course of the period of time. Uh, I'll give way to my honourable friend first. Would my honourable friend, I'm listening very carefully to what he says, agree that if, as a result of this referendum, a political scalp was gained and a seat lost, that an opposing party would get out and vote for such a thing as they do at the general election? I, I accept the numbers are down, but still significant numbers are voted. And even the numbers he's talking about uh, would be very possible if a seat was gained and a scalp He's he presuming that he is presuming, and this point came up a number of times, particularly with the member for Rhonda, but for, with others too. He is presuming that his constituents would vote on the basis of a simple political judgment. They wanted a Labour government or a Tory government or a Liberal government or whatever it might be, or even a UKIP government, uh, and they'd get out and vote on that basis. I do not believe that's how our constituents behave. <laughs> uh, our constituents behave uh, uh, in a moral way. They make judgments about us. There are plenty of my constituents, I know, I've discussed this with a number of them, uh, who are not people who vote for me, ever. Never in my time in my constituency, over 20 odd years, have they ever voted for me, but they would not vote to remove me on this basis. They don't make those judgments on a political basis. They would recognise that this was a quasi-judicial judgment they were making, and that is, that is why I think we are better off trusting the public than trusting the hierarchy in this house. The Honourable Member wanted to intervene. Thank you. Thank you. I thank the Honourable Member for giving way. I think much of what he says is very true about our constituents. However, I think perhaps he's slightly out of date about the collecting of signatures nowadays. We see 38 degrees managing to inundate us with, with emails. I don't think it would be that difficult now with modern technology to get a great number of um, signatures as it used to be. Well, I think, he, I think he sort of missed the point that my honourable friend for Richmond Park made, and, and that was <laughs> that this was not going to be an electronic collection. This was going to be effectively a physical collection of votes. And so you've got to get out and go down to your town hall, go down to your polling station, go down to the four locations I think we nominated for any, any given constituency. Uh, we thought about that very point, uh, and uh, indeed that's one of the things we crowd tested over, over those 40,000 people, that people recognise, and even the members of 38 Degrees recognise that that would be the wrong way to carry out this process. It has to be a process where people exercise a moral judgment and overcome a physical hurdle of having to go down there to do something about it, which again is why I think we're better off trusting our own constituents. The number of 20% was argued about a great, uh, a great deal in the committee when we, when we talked about this. And some talked about 25% and some talked about less. Uh, the, the simple truth is that 20% is pretty much the norm internationally. Uh, most other countries, if not all other countries, when they exercise this mechanism, do not see uh, many vexatious, uh, many vexatious uh, uh, actions. And even in America, the Honourable Gentleman made, I think, very legitimate points about the role of big money in this exercise. Uh, even in America, we only saw one replacement of a California governor over a century of this, despite the fact many of them would be, would many, I'm, I'm coming to the end of my, uh, uh, my, my remarks, uh, many of them would have been uh, uh, vehemently uh, opposed by, by, by big corporate interests. But that we can deal with in any event. That we can deal with by the regulations and the laws 
that surround, uh, that surround this act when we make it an act of parliament in due course. This is an incredibly important bill, uh, but I think the government has really got it quite materially wrong. This is one of those rare occasions when it's for the House of Commons to make the judgment uh, which, will, uh, which will actually decide our own future.